Put on your sweats. No need to shave. Kick back and relax. Because it's Philosophy Friday with Matthew Weiss. Where we start off the weekend casual. Hey folks, Matthew Weiss here, weissadvice.com. Welcome to Philosophy Friday. Today we're going to be getting into some pretty interesting territories, maybe slightly conspiratorial territories, so I'm wearing my conspiracy theory glasses. They're probably actually really obnoxious because they're mirror glasses, so I'm going to take them off. But we're going to be talking about Spotify, and uh, we're not going to spend too much time on Neil Young here, but maybe just a little bit. Spotify has been controversial since it started, mainly because musicians have been uploading music to Spotify and seemingly never getting paid anything substantial from them. So in this video, I want to unpack how Spotify pays and then what the controversy really boils down to so that we can understand what things are maybe really about, because they certainly predate 2022. Okay, so how does Spotify pay? Well, first, how does Spotify get paid, right? Spotify gets paid two ways. Either people subscribe for their service or ads pay them to host. Now, those two revenues are looked at differently. And depending on who's streaming in Spotify, the payout will come at different proportions from subscribership to ads. They both collect into large collections of money, and then whichever one is bigger is how things get paid out. So, when Spotify pays out, they pay out anywhere between a third of a cent to almost a cent. Now, that might sound like a pretty wide range, and it is, and so people will typically calculate the average to be 0.43 of a cent, but in reality, it's actually not that. It's usually anything but that. For most people putting music up on Spotify, it is a third of a cent, and for other people putting music up on Spotify, it's usually closer to 0.43 if they are backed by like a major label. So it's really a very different story because the streaming is not paid out in any kind of unilateral way. If you're streaming in America, you're probably making about a third of a cent, but if you're streaming in South Korea, you're probably making about 0.8. Eight tenths of a cent? Yeah, eight tenths of a cent. There we go. So it is definitely not across the board the same, and that makes things certainly complicated. And we're going to jump back to a little bit of that a little bit later, because sometimes complication is a little bit more nefarious than just purely being complicated. But once that payment is collected and they figure it out, it's divided a little bit differently too. It's not just one lump sum going to a single aggregator and then being split up. It's actually being aggregated by Spotify themselves. So the sound recording might get a certain percentage of revenue and then the publishing side might get a different percentage of revenue. Now, the sound recording, we'll talk about that at first, is a license to actually play the physical recording of a song. So somebody comes up with a song, then a label pays to have that recorded. That recording, called the master, is then licensed to Spotify. And the number of streams that it gets, there is a payback for that license. And it's typically somewhere between the high 40s to the low 60s in terms of a percentage. Now, it's going to be different depending on who's doing that negotiation. And this is very, very important. If you are signing a contract by self-uploading or you have a small label that does not have a seat at the table to negotiate with Spotify, you are going to get something to the tune of the low 50s, maybe even lower, because that's just the bare minimum that they can get away with. Whereas if you happen to be, say, Sony or Atlantic or Warner or another major label, then you can negotiate with Spotify and say, no, you need to pay us 60% to hold our catalog. Otherwise, you're not going to get to use our popular artists. Okay, nothing too weird about that, but we're going to have to circle back to that one as well (laughs) because it's going to get sticky fast. You guys with me so far? All right, now let's move over to the publishing side. The publishing refers to the intellectual property. That is the song as it is thought, the creative concept that is the song before it is recorded. And there are two royalties that Spotify pays out for that. One is a performance royalty, which is the actual broadcast of the song. And the other one is a mechanical royalty, which is a license for the right to uh, reproduce and 
redistribute the song. So all of that currently makes up about 15% of net revenue. And you might be thinking, wow, 15% is pretty significantly lower than what's being paid out to the sound recording. And the answer to that is because it is. It's actually a lot lower. And one of the biggest problems with Spotify has been the aggregation. And I think that this is not just Spotify. I think this is just our culture in general. Music changed very much when we moved from physical copies being reproduced to online distribution of digital data. Back in the 90s, the amount of money that it took to both physically create a sound recording and then also manufacture and distribute that sound recording was very high comparative to the amount of cost it took to sit down with a piece of paper and write the song. You know, one is a lot of overhead, the other one is almost nothing. And so some difference in payout does make a little bit of sense, especially since the sound recording can only be one thing, but every iteration and derivative work of the idea of a song can spread out to multiple sources. There can be 20 different versions of a song that are all collecting publishing, but each one of those recordings is only collecting one stream. So having disproportion makes a little bit of sense in that day and age, but when we move to the digital world, we're just holding those ideas over. There's no longer really the same manufacturing costs at all for a sound recording. There's certainly no distribution costs. Uploading is free. In addition to that, okay, it is a little expensive to produce a record, but compared to what it was back in the 90s, I know that for engineers, such as myself, the fees are basically half, and the dollar's worth half. So it's basically 25% of the value, right? So it's a very, very different world, but we still have a world where the sound recording is being paid out 50 to 60%, and the actual idea of the song is 15 and I should also add, songwriters have had to fight hard for that 15% because it started at 10 <laughs> and it has been contested every percentage point along the way. In my personal opinion, I think it is still, still too low. But that is not Spotify's fault alone. That is the culture that we live in and we need to change the culture. And I'm just gonna say one more thing about that. In my mind, on paper, a sound recording of a song is equally two things. It is equally the recording itself and the song because you cannot have one without the other. They are just as important. So within that unit, it is actually 50-50 in value and any deviation from that 50-50 needs to be justified. So I think that 15% is still too low comparative to the sound recording, even if Spotify and other companies need to take money away from the sound recording, I just got fired from every label gig I ever had, and move it <laughs> to, the to the actual value of the song. Call me crazy. Okay, so that's the payout system. Now, why don't artists like this? There's a few reasons. First of all, for anybody writing the song, they're probably looking at this and going, not only am I only collecting 15% of the net of what they're making off of my music, but on top of that, I also have to have somebody who's going to allocate that 15%, right? So if I write a song and I write a song with an artist, I may have to give up some of my publishing just to work with that artist, for one, and it would be worth it because that artist is going to sell the song more than somebody else might. So that's a very common practice. Not Spotify's fault, but just one of the many, many problems with the way that songwriters and artists are getting paid. Artists are only doing this because they're not getting paid well either, and we're going to get to that, but songwriters are losing a little bit of money right there. Then they need an advocate. You usually need a PRO and also some kind of a collection agency for your mechanicals. You know, whether it's Harry Fox or, uh, uh, what's, what's the other one? Audit, Audemite or something, Autumn? Somebody in the comment sections below, help me out here. But typically with your publishing company, you're giving up 50% of the publishing right? Just to administer. And that company may or may not be doing what they need to do because Spotify is responsible for their data collection. And right now there is no national oversight for that data collection. That's part of what the Modern Music Modernization Act is trying to establish, which they are fighting. On top of that, the publishing company might not have the money or the means or resources to audit, or they might just be incentivized not to. 
So you're paying 50% to a company that may or may not be doing its job, and you have no way of knowing. With all that said, there is something called an unmatched music fund that exists in all of these major streaming companies where it's just a big pile of money that nobody's claimed. Yeah, <laughs> that's going to bring us over to Neil Young pretty soon. But now let's take a look at the artists and why the artists are complaining first. Well, it's because, really because of the record labels, artists are only typically collecting 10 to 18% of their sale of, of sound recording off of you know, the rest, and that really doesn't leave too much. When your total payout is really only about 75% of one-third of a cent per stream, and then you only get a tenth of that to maybe a fifth of that if you happen to be a really big artist, that sucks. That's a that's nothing. So that's why artists are trying to dip into the publisher side of things, because they're trying to get paid, which isn't really great, but I get it. I understand where it's coming from. So this is why people are mad. Now, let's take a look at Neil Young. Neil Young, he said he's going to pull his music, or he's now pulled his music because of Joe Rogan, right? He doesn't like what Joe Rogan has to say, and therefore he doesn't want his music on Spotify. Conspiracy time. We're going to go... We're going to go a little bit down this rabbit hole, all right? Here we go. In 2017, Wixen Publishing sues Spotify, as well as some other companies, uh, but I believe Spotify was the main one, for un unclaimed or, or undistributed music royalties, publishing royalties. There it is, yes. Wixen is the publishing company. They sued Spotify because they were not getting publishing that they were owed. Right? They settle for an undisclosed amount. Then the Music Modernization Act starts coming into effect, and this idea of an oversight for these unmatched music funds starts to come up, and Spotify starts to kind of panic and go, no, no, we need to fight this, all right? Uh, it's, songwriters are going to get paid too much if this passes and we can't afford it, right? That's the excuse. I think it's a little deeper than that. Now, here we are. I don't think that Neil Young has ever liked Spotify. I don't think a lot of artists have ever liked Spotify, but Neil Young sold a lot of his publishing to Hypnosis, which is a publishing rights allocation group and ownership group, uh, which has ties to some other companies, but then we're getting really deep down a conspiracy hole. Okay, so he's sold a bunch of his rights, and typically when you sell your rights, you're selling both royalties on those rights, and then you're also selling some degree of controlling rights, like the right to distribute. But there is a specific controlling right called a morality right, and he may not have sold that in the hypnosis contract. He might still own his moral rights to his music. Many artists, in fact, do. So they, he might be selling the, the property of his IP, but he still has moral rights over it. What's a moral right? Well, it's exactly what it sounds like. If I make some music and there's a KKK rally and they want to play my song during that rally as like the theme or whatever, my moral rights say I can tell them to go fuck themselves. And rightfully, I would. Now, how does that affect Neil Young? Joe Rogan has his podcast. It's now backed and contracted with Spotify. And he says, it's my moral rights not to have my music on here because I don't like what he has to say. And he's not wrong. That's what a moral right is. So my guess is that this is just sort of a good catalyst to get his music off of Spotify. And there's probably no surprise that a lot of artists are following suit because they're seeing a loophole. They can get their music away from a company that they feel has been cheating artists for a long time. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do, maybe. I don't know. Tell me if you think that that's right or wrong. Uh, I think that there's a big gray area involved in all of it. Okay, now... Let's get down the rabbit hole, the real conspiratorial rabbit hole here. Let's start with Daniel Eck. Okay. Is Spotify stealing music from artists? Big question. Okay. Does Daniel Eck have priors? He sure does. He was the founder of a company called MuTorrent. The way that MuTorrent functioned is it served as a peer-to-peer -peer platform where people could upload music and download music without having to compensate anyone for their IP because they said, hey, we're just the middleman. We're just a platform. It's every individual user who's violating your IP, so therefore you're going to have to just sue every individual person if you have a copyright claim, right? But in the process of that, I am going to get ad revenue 
on my platform. So MuTorrent's making money without having to pay any of it out, and in the process, really strongly diminishing the value of music, because suddenly musicians don't have to get paid for their sound recordings or their publishing. Yikes. Now, was this morally wrong? I'd say yes. Some people might disagree, but the people who disagree would be wrong. I don't know. If you disagree, feel free to comment, but you're wrong. Uh, And he knows this. He knew it. Everybody who was making these peer-to-peer platforms knew it. They knew that they were violating copyright. Copyright has been in effect in the modern form since 1972. This is not new to anyone. They just found a loophole that it didn't necessarily extend to the digital world and were able to say, well, we're not technically doing it. Now, of course, this ended up getting shut down, but then Daniel Eck goes and he just starts Spotify and he figures out a way in which he can pay the minimum. Turns out, though, even if they just pay the minimum based on this form of business model, they can't make money because (laughs) it turns out when you give something away for basically free, it's really hard to remunerate. Duh! Turns out if you devalue something, it becomes really hard to sell. Before we talk about the way that Spotify really makes money, let's talk about the way that Spotify tries to make money because I think it's important to touch on a few little cornerstones in this. First of all, Spotify mainly makes money through ad revenue. People will oftentimes talk about one of the boons of Spotify being that it levels the playing field. You no longer have to be on a label in order to get your music out there because you can just upload it directly to Spotify. And therefore, it works against the commercialization of music. Unfortunately, it does the opposite. Because the payout comes from advertisement companies, it actually ends up working entirely into the commercialization of music. And I will give you a perfect example of that. Back in the day, if you wanted a particular song, you went to the store and you bought that song. Now, if you want a particular song, you tune into Spotify, the ad revenue gets generated, and the advertiser pays Spotify for the attention. So you're not paying, the advertisement company is paying. Well, how does that affect things? So what? Who cares who's paying for it? How does that commercialize music or commodify music? Like, that seems like a stretch. Mm, Is it a stretch, though? Let's talk about one of Daniel Ek's famous statements. He said that you can't just put out an album once a year or once every few years and expect to be able to make a living that way. Times have changed. So what he's really saying is you need to put out a larger quantity of music in order to make money. Now, that might just feel like a comment on the zeitgeist, but it's a little deeper than that, right? If advertisers are paying, then you need more people paying attention to your site. Those clicks, those views, those streams, that's data that tells the advertisers how much attention your platform's worth, and therefore how much you can sell your platform's value to them. So the more people who are streaming on Spotify, the more valuable Spotify is to advertisers, right? Well, that means that it is directly incentivized for Daniel Eck to encourage people to make a larger quantity of music. And he's not talking to the labels when he says that. Most of the people putting music on Spotify are not major labels. They're indies and independents and unsigned, right? Now, (laughs) why does he care if people are putting more and more content up on his platform? Because that's working like a pyramid scheme. It's working like a Ponzi scheme. It's saying you're now the consumer. You think you're putting up your music as the producer of the product, but actually you're the consumer of our ad space. Because now you're going to go tell your family and your friends to tune into Spotify to listen to your record. Meaning the overall base of Spotify gets enlarged when people with small fan bases get their collective, their little friends and family and all that, to tune into Spotify. So it's valuable to Daniel Eck to have as many people putting as much content up as possible because that ultimately increases the value of their ad base, which means that from Spotify's point of view, quantity of music is vastly more important than quality of music. But that's not the only way that companies make money. Another big way that companies make money is through something called equities. So uh, let me explain equities real quick. I'm just going to take a random company. I I don't know where I'm getting this from. Let's say, mm, I don't know, Sony Music. And Sony Music makes money by selling music, but they also have funds that they invest. 
They might invest into real estate. They might invest into currencies. They might invest into other companies. So, for example, if I'm Sony Music and I want to invest some money in a company that I think has uh, somewhere to go, maybe it's going to take off one day. I don't know, a company like Spotify? I could probably take a big old chunk of my cash and buy, I don't know, say like 6% of Spotify and then make money through my equities. Well, turns out that Spotify is supported, about 20% of its ownership is from major music labels. So I don't think it's a coincidence that even though they've been running in the red since basically the start, I think they just got into a 0.08% profit margin this year. So congratulations, Spotify, on getting into the black. But they ran in the red for a long time. Obviously, they needed to be propped up by somebody who's willing to still allow them to sell music at a loss over that period of time, and I don't think it's surprising that major music companies have done this. I also don't think it's surprising that when we circle back to how the payout works, that the major music companies get a seat at the table when negotiating their licensing agreements. Kind of sucks for the indies, but the labels are going to get more of that total pie. No surprise there. Okay, but let's talk about equities a little bit more, right? Because at the end of the day, Daniel Eck is making money. He's making money, the higher-ups at Spotify are making money. How are they making money if their business isn't? Well, they're paying their employees somehow. They've got homes, right? They drive cars. The money is coming from somewhere. Well, chances are it's coming from their equities. And when I say chances are, I mean there's no chance to it. We just you know, heard that Daniel Eck decided to take $100 million and invest it into a war defense company. So, obviously, equities has something to do with it. Now, an equity is something that holds some kind of value. So, if I have, let's say, a house, I can go to a bank and say, hey, I've got a house. Could I use that as collateral to get a loan or to get some money and then I'll use the house to represent the value that I have to pay you back? Sure can. Anything that holds value can be used as a form of collateral when it comes to picking up money. So if there's a large enough equity fund in some way, shape, or form, the CEO of Spotify can then pay the employees through a bank loan or even just a bank agreement. It doesn't even necessarily have to be a traditional loan. So equities might just possibly, perhaps maybe, be the source of Spotify's ability to remunerate. Now, it gets a little bit deeper than that. Right. This is where the conspiracy starts to kind of pop up and bubble a little bit. If Spotify is not making money through music, they are probably making money through equities, in which case they are not a music company. They're a finance company. And that's important to recognize. Spotify is probably not a music company. They are probably a finance company. I can't prove that. But it sounds pretty right, because last I checked, they do employ people and pay them out of the money they don't make. Now, how do they have capital to create an equities fund? It has to come from somewhere, and it's not coming from what they're selling. But maybe it's coming from what they're not paying out. Remember that unmatched music fund? Remember how Spotify kind of got really defensive about paying the the songwriters an extra 5 to 10% or whatever it was? Well, 5 to 10% of what? You're not making money regardless. You've been propped up regardless. So is that really what's going on? Or maybe it's the unmatched music fund that's going to get oversight. Because when the Music Modernization Act first passed, immediately $460 million of unmatched music funds from different streaming companies had to get paid out. My guess is that's probably the tip of the iceberg. That's probably why Neil Young's publishing company had to sue Spotify to get paid. And if Neil Young's publishing company, who represents other people like Tom Petty and other really big artists who have a good amount of catalog, and remember, catalog sells more than new music, if they're getting screwed out of publishing, what about us? Yeah, there's probably a very large unmatched music fund. Now, people will claim that unmatched music after an audit. 
You have to raise the money, by the way, to audit a company in order to get that. So you have to at least believe that the amount of money that is unmatched is equal to or greater than the amount of money it would cost to audit. So a lot of people don't audit. That really just becomes a chunk of money that sits there and you can manage that money. You can look at it and say, there's this money, it's here, it exists, and we only pay out 0.1% of it every year and it grows by about 1% every year. That's collateral. So the money that they're not paying songwriters, in theory, I don't know how much it is, but in theory, that could be collateral to build an equity sum so that they can go and invest in war defense and make money that way. So let's recap all of it. Spotify pays less. They don't even make their money from music. They make it from somewhere else. Wherever that money is coming from, it's going into other equity companies like War Defense. And then we wonder why artists are not happy with Spotify. We've created a culture. The worst part of it is we've created a culture where the only two choices are to buy into this system or to not make money at all. Especially right now during COVID when it is very, very hard to tour. If you're a musician... It's hard to get paid at all. So your options are Spotify or bust. And that sucks. It puts you in a real quandary. The only people who are able to play out of that game are people who have already made enough money where they don't need that kind of source of income and they can get it from somewhere else. I remember in 2015, I was negotiating with a record label for a record that I produced, and one of the sticking points was distribution through Spotify. I did not want to distribute this record through Spotify. However, the label would not budge. They said, we cannot increase our risk by not distributing through one of our major payout systems. So we have created a culture where people are afraid to all just say no at the same time. If everybody says no at the same time, then we can change things around, but we have what's called a prisoner's dilemma. Unfortunately, all it takes is a few people to say, no, we're going to keep playing the game. And those are probably the people who have investments in Spotify. So if you have Sony, Warner, EMI, Atlantic, all investing into Spotify, are they going to pull their catalogs in solidarity with the other musicians out there? I don't think so. So, that's why people say Spotify is stealing from artists and musicians. It's not Spotify alone. Let's be clear. It's not Spotify alone. It's a system that has developed that has devalued recorded music to almost nothing. It's a system that has valued the record side so disproportionately to the songwriter's side that it's a miracle that people even still bother writing songs. It's a system where there's no accountability or oversight, and there's nobody collecting this money. The data itself is in the hands of the company that has to report on that data, and the, the payout itself is being unmatched to people who should be getting it. All of these things are deep within our culture and not the sole responsibility of Spotify. Spotify and Daniel Eck just happens to be the champion of the system that we're working against. Now, all that said, let's talk about all of the good things that Spotify does because I don't want this to be one-sided. All right, first of all, Okay, guys, that's my video. If you dig this video, hit that like button. If you want to catch more of these videos, hit subscribe with the bell notification. And as always, we are musicians, sound is our instrument, and I will catch you next time.